Have you ever had a bad day? How about a bad week? How about a bad month? How about a bad year? What was the cause of that tough period of life? Was it a job problem where you liked your job at one time but you got a new boss and you didn't like it? Or maybe you got laid off of a job you really enjoyed? Was it a relationship problem? Maybe you were dating someone and the relationship fell apart? Or you've been married for decades and the one spouse decided they didn't want to be married anymore? Was it a health issue where you went and you had, had a routine health checkup, you thought, and then it became a place where you were delivered lots of bad news? Was it, was it a family member you had lost unexpectedly and it took you months and years of working through that grief. We've all had times in our lives when we didn't just have, when we didn't have everything going right. When everything seemed to fall apart. You kind of think you had life organized and planned and then it gets changed. And while we've all had bad days and bad weeks and months and years, Israel had gone through a very tough period of life, the nation of Israel, except their period wasn't a few days or a few months or a few years. It was 600 years of pain and suffering they went through. And the scripture that Gib read for us today, this morning, describes the disappointment and heartache that two travelers are feeling after 600 years of tough life living under the oppression of other nations. After 600 years, they thought they had something good to look forward to. They thought the Messiah was there to rescue them, but that all changed in just one night. And as we celebrate Resurrection Sunday, let's enter into the minds of these two travelers going to Emmaus and try to feel and experience some of those things they experienced. The day was Sunday. Jesus had been arrested on a Thursday night. He was given a brief examination by the Jews, the rulers, the religious people. Then he was sentenced to be executed and placed on a cross by the Romans on Friday. It was Passover week, which meant Jerusalem was full of Jews there to celebrate the Passover celebration. Many people had traveled to Jerusalem and were spending time there. And these two people, these two Emmaus travelers which I'll call Emmaus Travelers as we go through our time together. Probably maybe two guys or a husband and wife possibly, we don't know. But we do know one's name was a man named Cleopas. These two Emmaus Travelers, they're going back home to Emmaus, leaving that disappointing event. They're going to travel seven miles, which is kind of like if you walk from here to Big Bend Community College, seven miles. And it's going to take them about two to two and a half hours on this journey. But Jesus showed up, and he began talking with them. And we read about that in Luke 24, 15, where Jesus shows up. It says, while they were walking and talking and discussing, Jesus himself approached and began traveling with them. Now here, the writer of this story, Luke, uses a literary device called literary irony, where you and I, as the readers, have information that the participants do not. So we kind of have the whole picture, but the participants don't know what's going on. We know that this is Jesus that shows up, but the participants don't know. And when it says these two Emmaus travelers were talking and discussing amongst each other, it uses the Greek word suzeteo, which is describing an emotional dialogue that they're having back and forth. It's intention, intense with emotion. They're upset, they're sad. They're disappointed. The guy they thought would deliver them from Rome got put up on a cross and eventually died. And these two amazed travelers, they don't recognize Jesus as he shows up. In verse 16, Luke writes, But their eyes were prevented from recognizing him, which was Jesus. Now, why would they not recognize Jesus? A couple of reasons are possible. Maybe Satan is involved in trying, trying to keep them blind, maybe. Maybe God somehow is preventing them from seeing Jesus. 
Maybe it's the traveler's own failure that they just don't recognize Jesus. Maybe they had never been close enough to Jesus to really get a good look at him. We're not quite sure. But whatever the reason is, they don't recognize Jesus as this man that joins them on the road. And a discussion begins between these two amazed travelers, between them and Jesus. Starting in verse 17, Jesus said to them, What are these things that you're exchanging with one another as you are walking? And they stood still, looking sad. One of them, named Cleopas, answered and said to him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem? And unaware of the things which have happened here in these days. And he said to him, I said to them, what things? And they said to him, the things about Jesus the Nazarene, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word, in the sight of God and all the people. And how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to the sentence of death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, because, uh, indeed, besides all this, it is the third day since these things happened. Verse 22. But also some women among us amazed us when they were at the tomb early in the morning and did not find his body. They came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just exactly as the women also had said, but him they did not see. So Jesus asked these two travelers, what are y'all talking about? It's kind of his, his calm question to them. And the Emmaus travelers, they don't understand how Jesus could not have known what's going on. Notice at the end of verse 17, it says, they stood still, looking sad. When Jesus asked them, what are you all talking about? It stopped them in their tracks. They're sad, disappointed, discouraged. They're in grief because of what had happened. And Cleopas has to ask Jesus, have you been taking a, a three-day nap? But where have you been? Were you out of town? How could you not know what was going on? A similar way, maybe it might be if you talk to someone now and you show them, you know, I got a new watch. And you say, that's great. Where'd you, where'd you get it? And you say, I got it from Amazon. And they say, from the, the region? How did a region of the Amazon send you a watch? And you have to say, no, this company, you must have not have heard of. Where you can buy anything in the world. Or you tell somebody, I bought a new computer this week. It's an Apple. And they say, did you buy a computer or did you go shopping and buy fruit? Which one? You have to say, no, apples are the best computers. Where have you been? Not, I don't use an apple, but I'm told <laughs> they're the best by people that use them, of course. Cleopas can't believe that this guy traveling with them has not heard of the things going on. And the Emmaus travelers, since this guy apparently is clueless, kind of walk through Jesus. All of these things that they expected to happen and that did happen. They describe for Jesus who he was. It's kind of interesting. They're telling Jesus who, who he was. They say that he was a prophet, mighty <coughs> indeed and in work. That he was amazing. And notice that, that word there, was, in verse 19. He was. He's dead. He's no longer alive. They describe who killed Jesus in verse 20. They say it was the chief priests and the rulers. But in there they describe them as our chief priests and our rulers. Part of, they were part of the group. It was the chief priests and rulers that kind of served Jesus up to Pilate. But it was the people that said, give us Barabbas. You take Jesus to the cross. It was part of their own fault. And they describe in verse 21 what they hoped Jesus would do. They were hoping Jesus would redeem Israel. At that time, the Jewish people were under the Roman Empire, under their oppression. It was their hope that through Jesus, God would work through the nation of Israel and free them from that oppression and deliver them into a new era. That 
was their hope. But that hope is clearly gone. It had been three days. Jesus is dead. There's no way to, you know, give him CPR, bring him back from the dead. It's been three days. Not only has it been three days, his body's gone, kind of adding to their confusion. What happened to him? Where did he go? Some angels said he's alive, but we don't even know what to believe anymore. It's kind of the state these two Emmaus travelers are in. And that literary irony is becoming more and more clear as we read along. They say they miss Jesus, but they're missing Jesus right in front of them. And this is a good reminder for us. Some people, they don't recognize what God is doing in their lives. Some people, they miss what God's doing in their lives. God works in mysterious ways. Sometimes people miss the way he's organizing things or orchestrating events. And when you're a participant in the story, when you're going through difficult times, it's really easy not to recognize how God is working and miss what he's doing right in front of you. And that's part of our job as believers is we're supposed to help other people, both believers and believers, recognize how God is working in their lives. That's part of our responsibility. We can be the reader of their story. As they're a participant in it, we can be kind of that outside person, that reader that sees what's going on, that knows what they don't know and can help them see what they don't see. For believers, we need to encourage them during those difficult and hard days. We need to remind them about how God has worked in their life in the past. Share with them some of the encouraging Bible stories they know but they forget. Quote scripture back to them. That we know they know, but they're kind of forgetting in those moments. And it's important even probably more for unbelievers to show them how God is working in their lives. And how God is providing for their needs during difficult times. Zig Ziglar, the Christian, uh, he was a motivational speaker, but a good, solid Christian man. He used to say, every day I read my Bible and I read the newspaper. Because I want to know what both sides are up to, he would say. But there's some people that are not believers. They only have the newspaper. They only see one side of the story. And that's part of us being involved in their lives to describe for them the other part of the story. So in the story, after the confusion of these two Emmaus travelers... We see that Jesus confronts them with some scripture and walks them through the Old Testament. Now, confronted, that seems a little strong, you might say, Pastor, right? To say that Jesus confronted them, you know, that sweet, loving, tender-hearted, gentle, soft-spoken Jesus, he wouldn't confront anyone, would he? It says in verse 25, Jesus responds to them. He's asked them two questions. They've had their chance to share. Now it's Jesus' turn to talk. He says, Oh, foolish men, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter his glory? Jesus uses, or Luke records it in a way, with that word, oh, the Greek word omega, which is a, an interjection of intense emotion to grab their attention. Oh, you foolish men. Means that they're without sense and without understanding. He calls them slow of heart, which means they're dull, slow to comprehend, and slow to act. I'm not sure about you, but that feels like me sometimes. How many times do I have to read the same scriptures and still not apply them right? How, do I, how many times do I have to keep saying the wrong things in difficult situations until I learn it. It takes time and effort to apply it. But Jesus right here, because he says they don't understand scriptures, he could have pulled out his nail prints and showed them, this is me. But he takes the patient option, and he takes them through the scriptures. And he tutors them in the scriptures. Starting in verse 27, it says, then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all scriptures. 
And they approached the village where they were going, and he acted as though he were going farther. This was a long discussion, starting with Genesis, going through all the prophets. In the Hebrew Bible, the last book would have been Chronicles, and ours it's Malachi. But Jesus kind of takes them through and explains how scriptures related to him in his life. All the scriptures, he says. And he helped these two amazed travelers interpret what they meant and how they pointed to him. N.T. Wright, who is a scholar that lives in uh, Britain but writes some good commentaries, he says about this verse, These two Emmaus travelers, like everybody else in Israel, had been reading the Bible through the wrong end of the telescope. They'd been seeing it as a longing story of how God would redeem Israel from suffering, but it was instead the story of how God would redeem Israel through suffering. Through, in particular, the suffering which would be taken on himself by Israel's representative, the Messiah, Jesus. So Jesus calls them out for not knowing scriptures. He then tutors them in the Old Testament, and then Jesus hosts the meal. Now, he joined them. They're returning home, but Jesus somehow ends up becoming the host of this meal in verse 29 and 30. But they urged him, saying, Stay with us, for it's getting toward evening, and the day is now nearly over. So we went in to stay with them. When he had reclined at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed it. And breaking it, he began giving it to them. The travelers still don't know it was Jesus. But they knew something was different about him. Something about these two amazed travelers let Jesus bless the food, break it, and then give it to them. Was it because he was the oldest person of them? Maybe. Maybe it's because they respected him from his teaching of scripture? Maybe. Maybe they just knew something was special and different. And as we read about how Jesus confronts these two amazed travelers with scripture, it's a good reminder that followers of Jesus should know the word that describes him. That's why Jesus was kind of upset with these two travelers. They should never have been sad in the first place if they knew the scriptures. They should never have been sad in the first place if they had listened to what he'd been telling the disciples for three years about himself. Right? Their pagan cultural expectations had overridden what scripture said. What they wanted to see on the streets of Jerusalem, freedom, had overridden what they had read on the pages of Scripture, which was that the Messiah had to suffer. And that's one of the purposes at our church. We go through Scripture each week and kind of follow it verse by verse at times. And we've done sermon series going through the Old Testament. Last year we did a Directions to the Cross, a cradle series, where we looked at Old Testament prophecies of the Messiah being born. And the last three weeks we've done a series looking at prophecies of how Jesus would die. Because we should dedicate time, both at church and privately, to study God's word that describes him. And to do that, you need a good Bible. And I hope you have a good Bible that has a translation you can read and understand well. A good print size, even if you're young, you got to have something that's big enough you can read. And a Bible size where if, if it's so heavy you can't move it from the kitchen table to the coffee table, that can, you know, slow us down from reading it too, right? So you need to have something that's doable and usable. And we need to read it regularly as part of our devotion time or quiet time. Read it in the way that we study it. Take notes in it or in a journal. Warren Wiersbe used to say, you need to have a Bible that speaks to you, but you need to speak to your Bible. You know, write notes. Talk to it. Ask questions of it. Study it. And we need to read it in community. Just as Shirley had shared about the ladies, they've been going through the minor prophets for probably eight months now, seven months now, going chapter by chapter, just working through it in a community, studying it and talking about it together. Now, I know it sounds kind of common for to tell Christians to read Scripture, but it's not that common. It's becoming less common. 
So after Jesus has met them in their confusion, he's confronted them with some Old Testament scripture. He then comforts them by revealing himself to them. Starting in verse 31. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to one another, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was speaking to us on the road, while he was explaining the scriptures to us? And they got up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem, and found gathered together the eleven and those who were with them, saying, The Lord has really risen and has appeared to Simon. Then they began to relate their experiences on the road and how he was recognized by them in the breaking of bread. The two travelers, they don't seem super surprised when they learn. If they, they're surprised, but not super, super surprised. They knew something was different about this guy. The two Emmaus travelers, when they finally recognized him, you know, why didn't they know him earlier. We don't know. You know, they, they recognize him all of a sudden, but why was that? Did he go to pass them the bread, and they saw the nail prints? Maybe. Maybe they finally actually sat down, and they start to look each other in the eye, and they realize, that's Jesus, as they're actually going to stop. Maybe God worked in some spiritual way to finally reveal it to them. We don't really know. But we do know they were excited. Here, their tragedy has turned into a triumph. Jesus' death is no longer seen as failure. It's now fulfillment. The resurrection of Jesus has reversed all of their remorse. And they are excited. And they're not going to wait. They want to go tell other people about it. They decide to return to Jerusalem. It says, at that very hour. A phrase, it's kind of a general time marker. It means, you know, a short period of time after. It could have been immediately, or maybe they waited until the next morning when it was safe to travel. But they return to Jerusalem to tell other people. Because they want to reveal their good news to those 11 disciples that are lost and delusioned just like they are. Daryl Bach in his excitement says, uh, Daryl Bach in his commentary says, the excitement is so great that one report is interrupted by another. Did you notice that? They go to the 11 to tell them their testimony, and the 11 interrupt and say, Peter already saw him. You, you, that, what do you, oh, you, you guys saw him too. They're each excited. And these four little verses gives us a reminder of something that it's easy to forget. It's that the good news should be exciting to share with others. The gospel is exciting and should be shared with others. These two travelers found it to be good news and wanted to share it with others. And that's what gospel means, the root word. It comes all the way back from good news. Even the concise Oxford, what's the word? Secular dictionary admits that's the source of that word gospel, good news. And that tells us we should be excited to tell others the good news as well. You know, we're quick to post a picture on Facebook of flowers that, you know, someone gives us. But are we quick to post scripture on Good Friday about what Jesus did for us? We're quick to post pictures of a cute baby on Instagram. But are we quick to post anything about Jesus on Christmas and how he was a baby? That good news we share is that Christ, he died for our sins. He went on, on a cross and he died there for us. And God placed all of our sins on him. Jesus' blood was shed to cleanse us from our sins. That's part one, cleansing us from our sins. Part two was that Jesus conquered death three days later. He didn't just cleanse us from our sins, but he came back to life and conquered death. And we too, through our faith in him, conquered death just like he did. 
but you might not be ready to share that exciting good news because you haven't accepted it into your life today. And that's something as we close out our time together I'd like to invite you into today. Maybe you've been part of church for a while. You might even own a Bible and have read it. You've listened to sermons. But you haven't placed your faith in Christ for salvation. You haven't taken that step. And as we wrap up our time together, I'd like to invite you to do that. To say, Jesus, I need you. I'm a sinner. I've been like those amazed travelers cruising along, doing my thing, and don't even recognize your workings in my life. I've heard scripture, but not seen how it describes you. But that's the offer that he gives to every single person. For us to say, Jesus, I need you. I'm a sinner, and I need you as my Savior. And I place my faith in you for salvation. Let's pray together, and then we're going to sing one Sing a song as we end our time together. God, thank you for Easter Sunday, how Jesus came back to life. He didn't